What's up, everybody? Um, testing. So this week, I'm actually doing a special discussion. Uh, all week long, we're going to be talking about Black Lives Matter, and I've invited uh, maybe five, six, seven, eight, eight of my homies um, to answer questions and just to talk. So today, I will be joined by my, my homie Cam and um, KB of the Jabberwockies at 1 o'clock um, after that. So yeah, so he's supposed to come by any minute now. Um, just testing, can you hear me? Making sure that the sound, here, hey Cam. Um, there's like a purple button, there you go, yeah. Okay, just wait, just hang out for a minute. Cam! <laughs> <laughs> what up, Cam? What's up? What's up, man? Um, so just, let's just wait a few minutes. Um, I just want to do a quick, maybe intro, just to test. Can you hear me? Yeah. You're fine? Okay. Yeah, you're good. Yeah. So um, where are you now, man? Where, where are you living? Uh, I live in uh, Redlands uh, near uh, Riverside. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought you were in New York because of Nova. I was uh, Nova. for about like 15 years, and then I moved a year and a half ago, roughly, to SoCal. And so I was in Palm Springs okay. first, and then I moved up here. For work or just to come back home? Uh, my girlfriend, she's a, um, an MD, and so she was finishing her residency in Palm Springs, and then we moved oh. up to uh, like Inland Empire, San Bernardino. Nice, nice, yeah. nice. So. Nice to see your face. Oh, there's Richter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man. So, quick story. Richter chickened out, and he was like, "Oh man, you just hit up Cam. Just uh, ask the, Cam." The proper term is passing <laughs> on to someone yes. that talks a lot and has a big. There account. you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, man. So, so many years ago that we just used to like nerd out and talk about dance. You know. I know. So I miss. I miss. Long uh, time. I, I miss all the dance nerds. I think I wish there was more of them these days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. That's um, the, yeah. Yeah. Catch me up though. What, what are you doing now? I, I know you're a podcast, uh, the table of truth and you, you DJ. Yeah. Yeah. So in New York, I was DJing a lot. Um, I mean, I'm always doing a lot of stuff, but, uh, New York, I was DJing a lot. I was still podcasting and then, um, I was working for Marvel for a little while. Oh um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was there for a couple of years. And then from there, once I moved to California, started doing my own thing, freelancing on social media and doing some other stuff. Um, Cause I've been in social media as a job for like six, seven years now. And so oh. um, came back when I came out to SoCal, now I've been doing more um, design and social media. I'm still, we, uh, we just recently restarted our podcast, like getting back into the habit, maybe in January. So we're now, we just dropped our fifth episode yesterday. Um, wow. But yeah, so now, now that I've been kind of um, away from the bigger city these days, um, still, Transition DJing into like beat making, which has been fun. Shout out to Richter for helping me like understand that better and kind of work with that. But also, um, I'm just still doing podcasting. Like I, I work at a at a art agency in um, Costa Mesa, and so I'm um, art director over there. And then um, yeah, so just been kind of just enjoying the the slower pace of life in the suburbs as opposed to New York. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice. Well, it's good seeing your face, man. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, as people come in, if you guys want to just hang out and um, drop questions, I'll look for them at the, the very bottom. But um, yeah, let's, let's just kind of just start slow and like, let me know, like, what are your thoughts right now? How are you feeling with everything going on? Um, it's been interesting because it's more, so we did like, so we did a podcast about this over the weekend and, you know, uh, my friends and I have had our podcast. We're at, shoot, I think we just dropped a hundred and so 154th episode, I think. Wow. So on the, on the episode, we were talking about our Black Lives Matter episode, which was four years ago. And this was us talking about Ferguson, uh, not, not Ferguson, um, Alton Sterling, uh, Philando Castillo and that kind of stuff. And so, uh, one of my, uh, co-hosts, he actually went back and listened to it and he was like, Pretty much everything we said in 2016 can easily apply for what's going on right now. And so we had a conversation about it. And one of the things that we were kind of just talking about was, you know, the, the advent of all the, like, 
I'm not really a protester, but I still understand what's that's going on. And so I think one of the things I liked the most just recently was um, what Killer Mike said um, in Atlanta. And he was kind of saying, you know, you, protesting, that's a very important part of it, which also had evolved into, you know, rioting and looting. And these are all parts of, these, of the thing. But there's more to be done after everything is over. So, you know, the, the plotting, the planning, the strategizing, the mobilizing, like those aspects of it. And I think one of the things that um, I've been seeing popping up, which I really agree with, is people are starting to realize, you know, it's great to protest and to make your voice known, but like, if you're not a protester, that's okay. You can help in other ways, whether it's helping mm. with strategy, you know, helping with planning, or if you're a designer, you know, rocking with other designers to help them um, help the, these movements have better design that can communicate their message. So there's, there's, uh, there's other ways than just protesting that you can help. And so don't necessarily feel bad if you can't go out, you know, and, and protest at that time or whatever. <laughs> Shout out to Filio over at, out in the England. Um, but I think that's the one thing that I really want people to know that, you know, how can I help? What can I do? You know, of course, monetary is always good, but then also there's other ways you might be able to help. And I think, um, for me, that's where my mind has been going. Like it's been less of the hurt and angry part. It's more about, okay, what's our solution? How can we, you know, positively put some, take all this hurt and anger and then put it into some positive direction. I think, um, uh, the homie Cam, he directed me to, uh, sticks from, uh, dead prez one of his posts, and that's what kind of like what he was saying. He was like, yo, take all that negative energy and then you know, put it in somewhere that can help the overall conversation as opposed to just you know, doing that. And I think that was a really good uh, way to kind of look at it as well. It's just like, you don't necessarily, again, not everyone's a protester, but then if you're not a protester, then how else can you help? And whether it's monetary funds, whether it's helping with other people, you know, um, maybe, maybe it's even teaching your friend that doesn't understand why this is such an important thing. Like that helps as well, you know? Yeah, so you said something about right now, like you recognize that you weren't a protester, right? When was the first time you kind of realized that about yourself? Because, you know, sometimes people think, oh, I need to do that. I need to go out there. I need to do something. How did you know that that's not your thing? Um, well, I used to work at BET as well. And um, during BET, that was when, shoot, I'm trying to think of specifically what shooting it was because at BET we kind of covered them all and so I think I think it was actually you know we were putting a package together to kind of to memorize the people that had been passing it was like Sandra Bland it was Flander Castillo mm -hmm. Alton Sterling so I had finished the package uh legit went to sleep woke up and I had to add two more people into it and so and then there was protests and stuff like that and we had a conversation at work and I was kind of saying like I'm not really a protester one I don't like jail but two, I just didn't really, like, I just, it's just not me. Like, I don't, I'm out the chanting and then I, like, I get it and it's dope. But it, for me personally, I was trying to figure out what's another way that I can help in that realm. And I think, the, like, that helped me kind of get back. And um, Richard's talking about Occupy Wall Street. And I was like, I'm kind of with them too. I went down to Occupy Wall Street and kind of saw everything. But then for me, my mind was like, okay, cool to occupy this space. But, like, what's next? Like, I was always looking at that aspect of it. And so that, to me, kind of showed me, I'm like, okay, if, my thing isn't going somewhere chanting and, and being solidarity with a bunch of people. Like how else can I can kind of, you know, uh, impact and do with, with what skills that I have. And as opposed to, like you said, protesting is dope, you know, being on social media, you know, giving people tools and all that kind of stuff. That's also good. But on a micro level, how can I also uh, affect as well? And that might just be, you know, having a conversation with someone and helping them learn, you know, why the hurt in the um, conversation is the way it is in a non-judgmental way. And I think that's, I've done that as well. People hit me up and they, they're like, I, I get the anger, but I don't get this. And then I could be, you know, that person to help them with that. You know, not everyone has that mode. Some people I know, they, like, they're like, yo, don't hit me up. <laughs> I have no yeah. interest in expl explaining my black experience to you. But then there's other people that would be like, hey man, you're my homie. I want to help you um, understand where I'm coming from. And I think that's a dope thing too. Yeah. And it's good to hear from you, you know, that everyone deals with this their own way. Like they're dealing with this in a different way. Um, and also you, you kind of thought forward, right? That's interesting that you thought, yes, we're doing this right now. But after this is done, what else? Yeah. yeah. And that comes with um, a lot of the more, like a lot of people forget that like, Right now, there's a lot of things going on all at once. So part of it is, you know, COVID and like, you know, you're staying in place, which is kind of making people stir crazy. Then yes. that, which also, which also begets, you know, unemployment and all that kind of stuff. And then on top of that, you have, you know, 
uh, Trumpito's in, in the office and he's an idiot. And so then there's all these different factors, but like the other underlying factor is classism. So it's like, you know, when people stay in, in um, I think what people don't realize is like, you know, not everyone is hurting right now. Like there's people with money that are chilling. They're looking for property. They're just, you know, they got their Uber Eats and they're doing all that. So like, not everyone is like angry. There's a, there's a whole swath of people that aren't like that. And so there's a level of classism that I think people forget about that, that needs to be kind of addressed as well. So a lot of the protests and stuff like that, it starts with racism, but it, it, it actually has a lot to do with the, tra the classism, the wealth inequality, like, you know, the the understanding that you know if i if i lose my job and can't work right now can i you know survive for the next three months rent bills food and all that and if i can't why is that you know there's a lot of different levels to these things that aren't just about you know uh white cops beating black people like that's a big part of it but then the longer issue is why is that well there's a lot of privilege in there there's a lot of going back to classism and stuff like that so there's a lot of different aspects that go to it that's not just you know quote unquote black and white yeah. And um, I think two things you said to me that was like, oh, man, there's more things that are going on besides this. Um, the, plan the pandemic, right? This mm -hmm. is going on in the background of the pandemic. People have been on lockdown. They're looking for a place to like, you know, let out and let loose. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Um, it's interesting to me because a lot of people had asked me like, hey, you know, how are you doing in the pandemic and all that kind of stuff? And like, me, just personally, like, I went from New York City, where you can literally eat and do whatever you want at any given time, and I love that aspect of New York. Like, I love it. Two, on a Tuesday, I can go see an amazing artist, or I can see music, or I can go dance, or I can eat food at, you know, any type of food at 4 a.m., to going to the suburbs where none of that's around. So I've kind of already been staying in place for about two years. So I didn't, <laughs> so it wasn't really too much of a stretch for me, because I was kind of like, oh, I guess I have more time, you know, I'm not commuting to work, so I guess I have more time to be creative. And uh, I'd already had made that transition to interacting with my friends through digital means and that kind of stuff. So it didn't really affect me as much, but then I had to step back because I started to see um, my friends who were really going stir crazy because they, they really enjoyed in those um, human interactions and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And so I, it made me kind of relax a little bit because like, for me, this has been fine. Like I've actually been probably more creative, you know, I'm actually my productivity is cool, but like that's not everyone. And so have me made me have a little bit more empathy for that because I'm starting to see how important um, people uh, value those those physical interactions and all that kind of stuff. And so I think the the one thing that's been good about this is more people are starting to reach out to their friends and like that mm -hmm. they haven't talked to you a long time or having these video chats like, you know, uh, I was laughing because on House Party. I think one of my friends accidentally called me and it was like one of my b-boy friends and we hadn't talked in a minute but it wasn't like we're like enemies or we just we just haven't talked in a while and then we started chopping it up and we're like oh shit oh my bad well let's have a conversation and we caught up and he was letting me know what was up with him i was letting him what and let him him know what was up with me and so having those interactions i think um was awesome to kind of do that and so i think for me i've been kind of just taking that time where i was uh, People that I'm already like, I always do a million things already. And so now I've just been kind of just doing that, like you know, add that creativity, whether it's, you know, on the art side, whether it's on the design side, whether it's music wise or whatever, or even on podcasting and that kind of stuff. So I think for me, I enjoy that productivity in that time. But I also know that for other people, the mental health aspect of kind of just like taking time for yourself, like really being sick, because a lot of people, this is the first time they're alone by themselves for a long period of time. And a lot of people have never actually had to do that. And they're still starting to um, grapple with that, what that means, you know? And so that I, I recognize that as well. We're like, you know, some people, like, they, they haven't really just been sat alone with their thoughts in a minute now. And so a lot of it's, some of it's a scary place. But in other people, they've been like, man, I haven't really been alone to just, like, not do anything for a while. And it feels good. Like, you know, there's no boss telling me what to do or some coworker yapping in my face. I can actually just kind of chill a little bit and take a little step back. And I think... Um, it, it just, it really depends on how you look at it yourself. I know people are like, you know, uh, really annoyed. Then other people, they're just like, oh, I love it. I'm an introvert anyways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah you, you sound like you're speaking from an introvert. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, you know, for me, like I am, I am a extroverted introvert if you want to put uh, it that way. Yeah. And so um, like, I love talking and, you know, being interacting with people, but at the same time, I can completely be myself and just enjoy that and um, be creative in that. So, but I definitely recognize that for a lot of people, yeah, it's a lot harder. And I think 
for those people, it's time for them to either A, slow down a little bit, figure out for their own mental health wellness of like, you know, what is it that makes them a little uncomfortable about like not having that interaction with people or, you know, there's no sports to distract us. <laughs> so like, <laughs> you know, like, oh, maybe I am basic. I don't have a hobby. Maybe I should get a hobby. <laughs> like those small little conversations with yourself to figure out like, you know, it's completely fine to do absolutely nothing and just binge watch TV and be cool. Yeah. But, it, yeah. you know, like all these things are all valid ways to kind of deal with, you know, what's going on now. And that will help you later on, because I don't think the the changes it's there's never going to be a new normal, but there's definitely going to be a lot of changer, changes going on right now and how you adjust and adapt to that will help you in the long run, I think. So it's it's interesting now, especially with a lot of the um, dancers as well. Like I know a lot of um elders that I knew that were very uh, he re uh, hesitant to do like Zoom type uh, international type calls and like, you know, do those classes and damn near all of them got They're classes here. now. Yeah. And I was mm -hmm. like, huh, where were you in the 2008 when me and my homie Cricket were telling you guys this is the way? <laughs> yeah. So it's cool to see that though, but still, how are you adapting is basically how they're saying. Yeah, and good point, because we are all forced to be online, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you were adapted to this technology or not, you're, you're here. Yeah. And I, I think that also plays into the anger or what's going on, you know, with seeing the media, seeing the videos. You know, yeah. Will Smith said this quote. Um, I thought it was perfect. He said that, you know, racism has always existed. It's been going on. It's just now being filmed, mm -hmm. right? Pretty what much. do you think? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it, and it's also, you know, the the interesting time now is not necessarily that people are more woke or anything like that. It's just that now that it's more um, accessible, you know, and uh, I was trying to tell my friend because um, she had she had a she asked me about, you know, the George Floyd thing. And she's like, how come, you know, people and it was a genuine question, not being racist. She was just like, hey, you know, how come there's not as much um anger towards the Asian guy that was part of the four people that were involved in the situation. And so I had to like first, and then second, I had to be like, well, you know, Vietnamese Americans don't necessarily have a, a history of systemically, you know, killing unarmed black people. <laughs> but also, you know, the longer answer more is it's about because, you know, again, for black people, when we uh, interact with the police, we have we all have different aspects of things that we're thinking about when we're talking to them. Like I, again, I'm from the suburbs. I lived in New York for 15 years, almost 14 of those was in Brooklyn, still don't have a hood pass, but uh, my interactions with police are, are more than likely have been in a positive way, you know, good morning, that kind of stuff. But at the same time, I, I am very painfully aware that if any one of those police officers have a bad day, my survival rating goes down. And so that's something that I always think about. And that's something that black people always think about. And I think the, the empathy part of people not realizing that is the part that uh, for us, it's, it's, it's tiring because, you know, uh, there was a really good post where someone was like, you know, being a black person in America is having a really great day and then turning on the TV or your social and then seeing a black man uh, murdered on live tele uh, recorded and mm -hmm. then having to talk about that literally the whole day. And mm -hmm. so that aspect of it is there's certain aspects of the black experience that people you're not going to under you might not um understand it but you could have empathy for it and i think that's the underlining theme of, of, of what's going on right now it's more about the empathy and it's like you know it's not necessarily like we want you guys like we want you guys to join us and freaking you know uh talk about these oppressions and that kind of stuff but the empathy part is the baseline of it that kind of starts with it because like a lot of this racism shit ain't going away and it's just now more in the light. You know, you have uh, an openly racist uh, president. You have all these officials and that kind of stuff. And that's yeah. a whole other conversation. But yeah. it wasn't like uh, he didn't start this shit. He just amplified what was already there. So um, it's more about that. So I think the empathy for what Black people are going through and what we're feeling, what we're experiencing, is like is a, a good part, a good start with, from there. And then from there, you know, hey, help do what you need to do. Donate this, that. All those are great. Um, but that empathy aspect is the part that, as a black man in particular, like I actually, for my friends, that's what I, you know, I would be looking for. Other people want more. They want, you know, this and that. That's great. But I think on a base level, if just the empathy is where you start, I think that goes a long way um, to, you know, understanding. And, you know, when I've, everyone that's, you know, um, I grew up in Malpitas, California, and then like, you know, I hung with, you know, Filipinos and Vietnamese <laughs> and Mian and freaking, you know, uh, Chinese and uh, Samoans and this. So I'm like very aware of my Asian uh, American brothers and sisters and like 
So I've been around them and stuff. So I think that empathy aspect of it for me, because like same with them, when I learned parts about the culture that I didn't understand, I would ask a lot of questions yeah. and, and then they would just tell me and I'm like, holy crap. So it's, it's good to have that sharing moment and being able to do that, you know? Yeah, no, that's, that's dope. That's dope for you to say that. Um, I think people are, are, I guess, clumsy about how yes. to have that empathy yeah. Yeah. or how to talk about it or ask, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we're, and again, in, we are sick and tired of being sick and tired. So sometimes we don't want to talk about it. Like I'm mm. not here to freaking explain racism to you. Like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes I might be. And if I am, then hey, ask away. My favorite conversations are always with old, rich white people. They are fucking hilarious. Because really? purely, be, purely because they ask a lot of questions they feel they shouldn't. And because I'm a non-threatening Negro, <laughs> You can have a conversation and then they can learn something from that. And that's, and that's purely just because my parents, uh, when I was younger, they basically kind of taught me and my younger brothers to like, hey, you know, we are in, an, in a multicultural environment. So a lot of people that you guys interact, this is the first time they'll meet black people that aren't, you know, you know, uh, robbing them or on TV or something like that. So she's like, I'm not saying that you have to be the model citizen, but just understand that that, that you're your impression to them could be the, their first impression of a non, you know, stereotypical black person. And so like, I've had that in my head for a long time. And so, so if I'm in a position to help that one uh, random white person that thought all black people are lazy, that to not think Damn. that, then Damn. that actually helps, you know, like it's a, it's a very micro thing to do on a very, on a, from a macro viewpoint, but not everyone is like that. And so um, sometimes I think, part of our podcast is kind of helping with that aspect of it, of letting people know and hear how uh, black men have a conversation about these type of issues and like those type of things. Nice. Mappy's in here. He's saying hello. What's what up, up Mappy? Uh, if you guys want to drop a question for Cam, just leave it down there and I'll check the question cards. Shout out um, to all the, uh, the funky UGs. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's so crazy. They're, they're up in here. <laughs> Refugee funks. <laughs> yes. Yes, man. Uh, yeah, man, that's, um, yeah, that's, that's hard. I, I mean, I was trying to think, like, I can't imagine thinking that way, that you're thinking about how you're going to answer, how you're going to behave in front of a white person, you know, you want to set a good example or something like that. Yeah, so like, yeah. I mean, and, and again, that's not for everyone. Like, you know, sometimes we just want to be freaking, um, we just don't want to talk about it. Like, you know, it's like, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. the black man gets killed, you want to talk about it? No, nah, man, not really. Like, that's not for everyone. But some people that do, they definitely can, you know, and I think that's something that the um the other non-black people should understand that if you do ask a question and a black person doesn't want to talk about it just be like hey man yeah. totally understand and keep it moving and yeah, you know if, the, if it's a if it's someone like me that has a big mouth hey sure why not <laughs> but you know understand that and that you know one is it, it, we understand and uh the other cam who's on my podcast he was saying he was talking to some of his friends and they were kind of asking questions and they were a little bit awkward at certain points and he took it upon himself to help with that awkwardness to have like a, a dialogue and conversation which i thought was dope but not everyone is like that so you know just know that so there's you know, sometimes we don't want to talk about the systemic racism of the last 400 years <laughs> you know but sometimes yeah. we do you know like i think that that's the part that people got to remember you know yeah. and i think um you know it's a great and that to you know tie it back to like say gantz and stuff one of the things that you know, there's an ongoing conversation is like a lot of times, you know, there's a lot of elders that feel that a lot of the newer dancers don't really um, understand or appreciate the, the culture and the um, history of where that dance comes from, you know? And I think that's something that like on a very small and micro level is like, cool, if you're really into, you know, said black dance that you've learned and really understand the culture so that if you're teaching it, you're at the very least passing that on. And I think that's like a small way to just help in the overall aspect of it. You know, I think the, uh, even when you start to create your own things out of those things, out of those um, dances and stuff, but still understanding and still giving homage to where that comes from, that helps just on a larger scale because, you know, I, we, we, there, there's no, you know, black dance police running around telling people like, yo, these black people created this shit. <laughs> and there is, and it's annoying, but it's, they're not wrong, you know? And so helping for the non-black people that are, you know, part of this culture and, you know, guests, as a lot of people say, it's not that much of you to be like, hey, this dance was invented by X and this is where it came from. And you should know that if you like yeah. this style of dance. And I think that small thing is actually what a lot of people that don't even, you know, you don't, 
you don't got to sit there and be a protester and be, you know, part of the movement, but that small aspect of it helps as well, you know, because I think sometimes that gets lost as the generations go by. So a lot of the newer dancers, they just want to dance and learn, you know, oh, freestyle and this and that, but understand, okay, you're freestyling, but you did, there's five different moves there from five different dance styles and all those dance styles have history and people that made it, you know? So something like that is very small level, that micro, that a lot of dancers and elders as well, because now we're the elders, which is weird. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> so that's, that's, a, that's a small way for, you know, the newer, the, the people that are starting to pass it on to the young folks about that, you know, and really understanding, especially, and that's, you know, that comes, especially with a lot of the um, Asian dancers and the white dancers and all that, like, you know, just the acknowledgement of where those dance styles come from and understanding that, passing that from one person to another, that helps so much because it keeps that alive. Because, you know, um, Don Campbell like, passed recently and all that kind I of know. stuff. And like, yeah. he, you know, he influenced a lot of people. And so if you are part of, you know, the locking community and understand, you understand mm -hmm. how important he was, mm -hmm. but also there's a lot of dancers that do parts of, of, you know, locking that don't know why he was so important on top mm -hmm. of everything else. So those little small tidbits really speak volumes. And it, it's, um, it goes back to the African proverb talking about uh, each one teach one. And that's a very powerful thing, but especially when it comes to dance, like you kind of have to bring that knowledge along with you. So it's, I don't care if you live in freaking Southeast Asia and you're teaching freaking b-boying, you should at least understand where that came from, why it came from, you know, don't, don't devoid the black experiences from those dances because it's just as important, you know, and like tap, pa passing that on to that one person that you're, that you're teaching, you never know, it might spark something that they might go back and like, you know, understand the history and go all that. But that, that little small thing is what you can do to kind of um, be part of that and to kind of keep that legacy going. Yes, and it's a huge legacy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I hear you. For those people that are teaching hip hop or that are passing that parts of that into their choreography, into their classes, educate yourself, right? Yeah. Totally. I mean, we have freaking Google now, you know, like some of the pioneers are still alive. Papa oh, yeah. Pete's still alive. Mr. Wiggle's still alive, you know? Yeah, um, a lot of them, yeah. and a lot of them are, are open to those questions, you know, and be respectful mm -hmm. for it. I think the, you know, every, every OG is different, you know, and they all have different styles of how they like questions to be formed. There are some, some OGs that if you ask them a basic question, they'll give you a basic answer. But then other ones be like, hey, you know what? I noticed that if I do this connected to this, that this happens. And another OG, they'll light up. They're like, oh, you're starting to understand the sauce. All right. So try this and this and that. And then you start to understand that there's more of a dialogue to your dance than more than you thought. And I think sometimes, and like, you know, I was in the choreo realm as well in California. And so sometimes that gets lost a little bit when it comes to choreography, because a lot of times, you know, we're putting a lot of different types of movements together into one thing. And, you know, if you don't really know that much about a certain part of uh, the dance that you're pulling from, it, you're, you're hesitant to let people know about it or whatever. You just kind of throw it into the mix. But, you know, we don't want it to be um, how kind of how MMA is now where like, which mirrors kind of like what well, freestyle dancing is. And you kind of have, you have all these little different pieces put into one, but then there's, they're not really that great at any of those pieces. And so it doesn't mean you've got to be a master at those pieces, but you should at least take a little bit of time to go up and like, you know, listen to that, understand that, where that comes from, why, why, you know, um, when you have an all styles battle and a, a really funky song comes on, you know, that there's a reason why people would start locking to that or boogaloo as opposed to just, you know, doing something else. Like the music does inform on your dance and understanding those different layers. Like there's a lot of, there's not as many dance nerds as I would like. And I miss that aspect of dance just in general, even if I'm not hardcore into the culture, like the folks that I know that are still dance nerds, we can still have these conversations now and understand like why the, the deep level of a lot of that stuff. Yeah, awesome. And so Mappy's in here, he's saying he agrees as someone who teaches the dance, he tries to pass on the info and history and respect the black culture that created it. Um, and I have someone named Jatan Gunter, I hope I'm saying your name right. In the last three years, he's asking what's been a popular area in the world to look at for dance style? Hmm. Um, New York City. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, actually, honestly, it's the, in the last three years, in terms of dance, there's been a resurgence of more um, hip hop dancing from, this, from the cities permeating more. Like, you know, you're seeing like Chicago footwork or you're starting to see, you know, um, you know, the turfing from the Bay. Like you're starting to see a little more pop-ups, which is awesome to see that. 
Um, and then you're, and then with things like TikTok and stuff, those things are starting to get global. Um, and I think that that part's awesome. And I think the part of it that we should, you know, remind remind ourselves are, especially for a lot of um, choreo dancers, is like it's dope that you learned the new fad or whatever that's coming out. But understand where that came from and why and how it, you know, how it, you know, started to, to go. Like, if you really want to learn, you know, new dance things, all you got to do is talk to the youth because, you know, hip hop is a young medium. It's always going to be that that vibrant aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot, I think a lot of times, sometimes people just don't know that. Like, they just see it on Fortnite or they just see it on <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Or they'll, you'll see the world of dance and they're just like, oh, that's cool. I want to learn that, you know, as opposed to being like, you know, a lot of us when we were younger, we would want, I want to learn locking. I want to learn b-boying. I want to learn house. I want, I want to learn these different aspects. And so I think for to search and start to see it, like, you know, you start to look at the youth more and really start to see like, oh, man, there's some stuff going popping off in the South. There's stuff popping off in J Chicago. You know, New York has certain things going on. The Bay has stuff. The L.A., like, you know, and then and then on top of that, you know, internationally, you know, international has been doing their, their thing, too. Like, my ex-girlfriend was a really was really into dance hall culture. She was the one that showed me about like dance hall dancing and understanding mm -hmm. like, you know, they have their, their shit is crazy by the way, but like they, if you and I are in a dance crew and we make a dance, that's part of dance hall, <laughs> you know? Oh. And so, but it, now if someone makes a song off of that one dance, boom, that even makes it larger. But the, there's a lot of foundations and a lot of, cause I was wondering, cause I was like, there's so many different types of dance hall stuff, but I realized it was an ever evolving thing. So, you know, people would, you know, would add to that to that dance as it went on. So, you know, you, all the stuff that we see is literally like, you know, the the, the more mainstream po popular stuff. But if you go to Jamaica and just go to the, you know, go to Nolinga, go to that, you'll see these small little dances pop off that you're not going to see on TV yet, but that's where it starts and then it starts to get bigger and bigger. So really getting that aspect of it. Um, oh, someone had a question there too. Yes. Uh, but because of COVID, folks are learning yeah. to dance at home from amateurs to folks who potentially may pursue it. I think that's awesome, by the way. Um, I think because we're at home, I think it's pretty good. Um, I think what it is is the now your audience is how is now bigger. So mm -hmm. say, for instance, you know, um, Mappy has a studio and he's doing his thing out there and um, instead of his studio being um, more constrained to where he's from in the Bay, it's now a global thing. It could be took him from anyone from all over the world. And so I think, you know, there is potential for instructors to go viral in terms of um, all this different types of stuff. But I think the, the, the barrier to access is easy now. So this is another problem as well, because, you know, you have been dancing for, you know, 20 plus years. I've been dancing for 20 plus years, but, you know, our class might have two people, and then the person that went viral on whatever revenge okay. thing has yeah. like a hundred people. Now, mm -hmm. does that mean that person's a better dancer? No, it just means that person's more popular at that time. Um, and so it's on to the dance community in general for us to educate our students to understand the difference and the levels of that. And that's the part that people really don't get sometimes because they're kind of like, you know, I laugh. Like one of my um, old interns, she's uh, she's dancing for a long time. You know, dance with a lot of kids and that kind of stuff teaches and all that and she's really big in like shuffle dancing which is the running man but whatever <laughs> <laughs> but not to discount it but to, to understand that like that's a whole section of people that really like that particular move have classes instructors and like a whole movement off of one move that we think is a funny move from hip-hop back then yeah. and they took in it and took all and it's like a whole level. yeah 100 mm percent. -hmm. so the barrier to entry to dance is a lot easier now because, you know, you know, people are starting to see it. That, that helped with, you know, America's Best Dance Crew, you know, World of the Dance and all that. Like, um, America's Best Dance Crew, I watched it more because our homies were on it. So it was fun to yeah. watch them. <laughs> like, I loved making oh. fun of, uh, I loved making fun of Slim when he was on there. That was great. <laughs> so I have a question from Kim Thang. She says, what's your opinion on the newest dance trend um, that sometimes, I guess, the remake is better than the original like for example the harlem shake the running man what you were just saying so that those things are interesting too because all right a, a quick story is um when i was djing someone came up to me and they're like hey can you play the running man song and i was like nope and they're like why i'm like go to google figure out what song it is and the actual name of it and then come back they legit went back running man could you play the ghost town djs <laughs> Because they didn't know it. They only knew it from the, that viral video of the you know, Running Man or whatever. This is a Jersey. It's actually a, a move from Jersey. But anyways, oh. 
I was laughing because it, for us with long memories, we can kind of pinpoint where these dances come from and all that. And for a lot of the younger people, they kind of don't know. So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily like it's a bad thing that things get um, remade because that shines light on something from before. But now mm -hmm. it's on us that know where that comes from to educate people about yes. that. You know, mm -hmm. so it's like it's cool that like, you know, these these things come in and like, you know, it shines light on whatever dance move that people forgot or the WAP. Or they, it doesn't really matter like what comes. But if you're a dancer and you have understanding of the history and all that, then it's on you to educate them about where it comes from and what they do. So it's like, you know, just because, you know, the, the latest trim might be something and it's like, like for, uh, to step back a bit, one thing that I learned back then was like, if I'm ever going to make fun of anything, uh, a dance or whatever, I will always learn how to do it first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because like, how can I make fun of something if I can't do it myself? You know, and like that, you know, in that mentality, but that kind of furthers your dancer. Because if you're a dancer, you know how to dance. So don't make fun of all the young kids doing those like, whatever ver uh, viral dance or whatever, you should be able to do it as a seasoned dancer just as well as any of those uh, dudes. But then come back with it from a, a position of um, understanding and history and being like, hey, that I know where that comes from. It comes from X, Y, Z, you know? And, and that comes back with that education because as you start to get more in the game of um, dance, that education aspect is very important. And I think sometimes we, people take it for granted a lot of times because they're, you know, too busy hustling for like, you know, you know, money and they want to make sure that everyone has classes and get in my classes, da, 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 which is all freaking dope. But like, as you start to have more knowledge and understanding, you just get that, give all that away because like you were, you're just passing on what learned, you know, you, someone taught you like me um, teaching house is I should be able to teach someone house in a smaller amount of time than I learned. It, it might've took me forever to get something right. But now that I know that I should be able to help someone in a smaller amount of time. And uh, now the feeling and everything else, you're on your own. But the basics, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, I got yeah. you, you know? Yeah, good point. A lot of dances and movement, they're like honed in a culture, in an area with the people and their lives and their stories. It comes from somewhere. Um, but yes, yeah, usually you don't know that. You're just seeing it off of a video game or a latest music video. Exactly. Yeah. And um, it takes a long time before you start to go, oh, yeah, this person created that. Oh, why? And how did that happen? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, shout um, out to Sillipode. Sil yeah, it, it's true, man. Like, we just got to really, as if you are a quote unquote elder in dance, which is even funnier as I say this, but, you know, it is on us to kind of educate. Like, we can make fun yeah. or we can help, you know? And so it's right. like, understand where that balance comes from. Because, like I said, a lot of people, they're just getting into dance because they did see it on Fortnite or they watched Grub mm -hmm. Dance. And, like, you know, I get, when I get freaking, um, uh, Video, people are giving me videos of like Keone and, and Mari. Like I okay, always yeah. laugh because they're just like, hey man, check this couple out. They're so yeah. cool. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you mean Mari, the homie that was in my crew for like X amount of time? They're like, oh my God, you know her? And I'm just like, oh. <laughs> yeah. So How funny. That's, that's the funny part, you know? Yeah. Uh, so Darky has an uh, interesting question. He says, hey, do you think there's discrimination in the dance community? And if so, what does it look like? I mean, that's a heavy, heavy topic. To sum it up in a uh, smaller way, there's a lot of, just, there's a lot of discrimination um, overseas, definitely, um, unfortunately. There, there's, there's a shout out to a lot of our international folks that, you know, employ a lot of dancers that, you know, give them the opportunities and that kind of stuff. That's dope. Um, it, there is, there's like a, like all things, it's a very subtle nuance of that. So it's kind of like, you know, um, one of the frustrations in, as being black in dance is that aspect of it, where you see, you know, someone um, elevated at a very high level in terms of getting the gigs, going on world tours, that A, is not that good, B, doesn't really have an ear to the culture, but then C, is a lot better about uh, marketing themselves or branding themselves so on that aspect there is a, a slight you know bias towards that um mm. but then also too you know as black people in dance we know that so now how are we going to um, overcome that so i think there is a slight bias to it and I shouldn't even say slight because i know there's people that have, have experienced some really heavy some really really heavy stuff you know they've had you know gigs canceled because of you know uh where you know where they're from what they look like and that kind of stuff for, oh, wow. a, you know, a very, you know, um, for, you know, a dance that's quote, quote unquote ours or something that we, you know, made. Um, and so for the non-Black um, people that have seen that happen, like, that's, that's where you guys come in. You know, it's like, 
if you know someone that is um, not of color and then they ask them, hey man, can you teach us how to twerk? And be like, uh, you know, it's really not might not be my place to teach that. Maybe you should look at these other, you know, um, black uh, instructors or dancers that have more knowledge that are way better, you know. Um, and uh, those 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 type of things. That's the kind of allies we kind of need within the dance community, where it's like there are a lot of black dancers that don't get those opportunities that are just as qualified and just uh, doesn't do it. So yeah, and so, I noticed. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Hey, no problem. Okay. No, I, I, know, I noticed that in, um, in hip-hop dances and freestyle dances, lineage matters. Who you learn from, yeah. like what you're doing, and, and like you said, giving credit and giving props to your teacher. Yeah. Whereas now, it's kind of like, because now everything's like instant, you know, whatever, it's like the dances are just now looking, getting looked at, like this is a product, like give it to me now kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And then again, that's always going to be the case. Um, you can't really, you can't really, it's going to be there, but that doesn't mean you need to, um, uh, you know, participate in that. And I think that's that aspect of it too, where it's like, you know, there's um, tons of people, like when I learned, like I learned house initially from watching like videos from Japanese people. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like I got, you know, I got one of the, the uh, serial style, serial uh, style steppers uh, DVDs from one of their, um, the Japanese dance videos. Me, I think it was like, Mappy and I think Dennis and a couple of other people were watching it and we're like, oh, okay. But going to New York, I learned who those guys learned from. And I was like, oh, 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 okay. I get it now, you know? But again, you know, like you said, you know, dance before was like, who did you learn from? You know, and, and for specifically when these styles come around. But now that there's an amalgamation of all these different things, um, now it's like there's less of a lineage. Like, you know, say for instance, we were talking about funkonometry earlier. And like, you know, there's a lot of people that came out of Funk and Amity that are doing some dope ass shit, you know? Shout out to Sean Evaristo and like, mm. you know, Mappy and, mm. you know, uh, Mari and like every, and then everyone else that owns like, you know, Emerson, of course, and owns the studios and stuff like that. So, you know, the lineage aspect of it, that's, and that comes back to us too, because we have to kind of make sure people understand that and know that. So as we teach younger people and all that, so that will kind of help with that expectation so that, you know, as a, as a, say, if you're, you know, black and you help create a certain style of dance, like your students are the ones that are going to help you um, get the, get your message out and spread out that way. Because a lot of times people won't go back to the source. They're like, well, I could hire that black guy or I could just hire <laughs> the, 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 the white kid that he taught that's closer and cheaper, you know? That's and like, true. That mentality is, is way more uh, prevalent than, you know, what's going on, you know? Yeah, good point. But yeah, it's the, it's the you know, and Victor said the result and pressure to fill the timeline outweighs the studying and the culture aspect is 100% true. You know, like a lot of people, they're just not really about that life. Like they're not really deep into this like a lot of people were, you know, before. And so um, you can't really, um, you can't, you can account for it, but then you have to figure out, okay, now that I know that, how am I going to be better? Or how am I going to, you know, succeed in spite of all that? And so it's one thing to, we, we can holler and hoot about, you know, um, other people getting jobs that we're not getting, or we can figure out a different uh, revenue model or a different way to, to reach out to the people that we want. Yeah, you know what I noticed about you, Cam? You're very solution focused. You're always thinking of what to do next. Are you there? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's always about, like, the, it's more about the, um, it's more about the forward thinking. It's always like, you know, thinking back, because I think, like I said, everyone has different roles to play. And so, like, say, for instance, like, I was never a great b-boy. I like b-boying. I have really good rhythm. I can dance really well. But b-boy-wise, my moves are very limited and all that stuff. But I taught way better because I had a better understanding of the dance and then how to impart what I did know to someone else. And so that I understood where my role was, and I was cool with that. Like, I'm never going to be, you know, a very, very famous b-boy. And I'm same with house. Like, I learned from really, really amazing people, and I pass it on to people that I know. I've taught some really dope b-boys that are doing some dope shit now, but that, that does, that's not on me to freaking brag about. I don't care about that aspect of it. It was more about teaching someone else. And so I like coming back from a, a big step back and look at everything from there and see how those pieces kind of move together, you know? Yeah, that's dope. And thank you for being down just to share today, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's always, uh, uh, it's always fun to chit-chat and be a dance nerd for a little while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... um. So today I heard you say three things that if we wanted to be supportive, um, to show empathy that, you know, not all your black friends want to talk about the definition of racism or talk about 
what's going on, like just give them some space. Uh, number two, as a dancer, if you're out there and you're an educator, then pay respect to the roots. Um, teach your students where the dances come from, um, specifically the styles. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and then number three, um, even if you're not a protester, that's okay. There's other ways that you could help. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely true. And I think, um, you know, um, someone else said, you know, it's so weird to judge people because of the way they look as a um, or their culture instead of their talent. And that's mm -hmm. 100% true. Like, that happens to black people all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> sad to say, you know, it's like, that's, that's why when, when I empathize when a lot of non-black people get a lot of shade from people because they're kind of saying, you know, you might not be doing hip hop or you're not doing this or that, or whatever. I've seen that before. I empathize with them. But sometimes I think the difference is kind of understanding where that comes from. Because like, mm. you know, we all have to figure out how we all play a role in this, you know, thing called dance. And so there are a lot of people, a lot of uh, us black dancers that do get annoyed at like, you know, certain dance styles and they're very vocal about it. But mm -hmm. so then now it's like, okay, if you're very vocal about it and you don't like that, well, have that dialogue with them to understand why they don't like that. Maybe they're looking for you to have more depth in your dance or maybe they were looking for you to explain it better, you know? Um, and, you know, all the, and that just comes again, just a communication and dialogue, you know, those things are like the, that, that helps with pretty much all these things. And so even these current times, like if people are confused about what to do and like all that kind of stuff, you know, reaching out to your friends and having them have those conversations and the folks that kind of just want to not want to talk about it, respect that. The people that do have a good dialogue, ask good questions and really um, have a better understanding of what's going on. The last thing you do is just to say stupid shit. <laughs> yeah. Like if you don't know, just be quiet yeah. and be fine. Like I'm not saying yeah. be silent as people talk about, but like you don't need to add to the dumbness, you can just ask the questions, you know? And, you know, if you really don't know something, then you need to find people that you can trust that can help you get those answers, because that's important. Like, that's more important than having a Facebook random or some tweet or some, you know, Instagram message about some dumbness. Like, nah, man, if you really don't know or don't have a trouble about understanding what's going on in this current climate, then seek out others that, excuse me, might have the same um, uh, questions. And so, and then that, you know, get a coalition together, you know, like, luckily I have a good friend set that I can do that with bounce ideas off of like same thing with you in terms of dance collective and all that kind of stuff. And part of the reason we had our podcast is because we realized that not everyone has that. So us having these conversations about certain topics helps other people too, you know, and I think um, hopefully in the future, we'll see more um, like dance conversations like that, like more dance nerd conversations that people can kind of understand about a lot of the legacies and all that. Cause I think, you know, each, each part of dance has rich culture and rich histories that can be shared with the young ones. And I think the the young ones that might not necessarily know, you know, they might not know why, you know, yeah. uh, uh, the mind, the mind tricks is an important group in the Bay area or uh, why people care about culture shock San Diego in the Southern, Southern California. Like what are these things that people talk about? I just know like little, you know, touches or whatever. So a lot of people's, um, dance knowledge is very short, so we have to help them and understand to so give them a little bit more history. Yeah, and um, now it's kind of safe too because they're in like these kind of like Zoom rehearsals, you know, since no one can gather. Um, so I was in a Zoom rehearsal the other day where people were asking questions and, and maybe they're young so they don't know and mm -hmm. it's okay, they don't sound dumb, you know, because yeah. I think that's what it is. People don't want to sound dumb. They don't want to like, you know, they're afraid of how a question may offend or may sound ignorant or whatever so it's kind of hard to talk about it yeah yeah exactly and that's why you have those um private conversations or those conversations you know where you can have those things because i think um specifically when it comes to yeah th these type of issues you know um the there's you know there's there's racism in dance we know this we, but it's and it can go on different areas from asian people white people and black people and all that kind of stuff so having that dialogue and conversation of how we can go be, be better is a lot better than just um, ignoring it or just going along with it, you know? Like, you see racism shit happen in the dance community, call that shit out and let other mm -hmm. folks know that that shit's mm -hmm. not cool. Like, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. a very... Cam's internet. I think, you know, th having those conversations and really... Oh, sorry. Get a bit? Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, having those conversations and, and really um, understanding what's up is very, very important. Yeah, just want to say what's up to some people. Alan Frias is in here. 
What's up, oh, Stacy? Yeah. Dude. <laughs> and Mappy <laughs> says, "Hey Cam, you're dropping all kinds of gems and history today." I know. <laughs> I got to I can say I, I think one of the things I forget sometimes is like, you know, we might have these conversations a lot, but I I sometimes forget that not everyone else is privy to it or um, might not understand or not know those kind of history tidbits and stuff like that. You know, I live, I'm from the Bay Area. I've lived in New York for a long time. I was around a lot of amazing dancers, a lot of history. I got to, you know, learn and listen and ask a bunch of questions and debate with a bunch, with a, a bunch of elders, which is probably one of my favorite things. You know, yelling, yelling and debating at 4 a.m. on a Saturday night about the history <laughs> of dance. It's freaking amazing. You love it. I know. I know you love it. Yeah. But, but those are those things that sometimes I forget that I, they, not everyone gets privy to. So it's good to kind of like put that out there and let people ask questions and kind of give that thought. Because just, you know, once you're part of dance, you're always going to be part of it, whether you're dancing all the time now or not. Like, you know, the, the good thing about your Boba Talk now is you're starting to talk to some of your friends on that level that like they might not be hardcore in those circles anymore, but they just have just as much knowledge as the person that's the, the it dancer of the moment, you know? Um, yeah. And so letting us to making sure that we add our voices to that and like help that legacy and all that will always be a good thing to kind of share that knowledge, you know? Yeah. And I appreciate dance so much more, right? Because I mean, really without it, I don't think I would have learned from so many different people, diverse backgrounds. I mean, that's what it was always like for me, like on any dance team, it was diverse. Um, same for you. What was your yeah. experience? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I learned being part of, you know, different, you know, or being around more dancers and that kind of stuff taught me the, the different aspects. Because, like, I was way more into, like, just freestyling and, like, DJing and, um, DJing and b-boying and not really understanding about choreography. Like, why? How difficult it was or, you know, um, syncopation and those kind of things. And so, um, and then also learning from different dancers that had different takes on dance. Like, you know, not some people came from ballet or, like, you know, People came from modern or, you know, um, some people, you know, they, their whole dance ends and starts with Janet Jackson. Like, I, I didn't understand <laughs> that, you know, like I, yeah. but now, but being around people like that made, gave me a lot more um, appreciation for it too. And so um, learning those different styles, even if it wasn't something for me, like um, for me, I learned, um, I learned like basic Vogue and whacking when I was in New York. And it was funny because the person that was teaching me, he was teaching me some Vogue. He was like a six foot five buff gay black dude. And he was like, oh, wow. all right. He's like, I'm teaching you to be fierce. And like, I was like, all right. He's like, but you know, again, you as a straight male, you could be fierce, but how does that, how would you do that? And how would you, you know, um, get that across? And so it was really funny because I never thought of it that way. Cause like, you know, usually when I think of fierce at that time and I was being ignorant, it was like, oh, fierce is kind of a gay term or a woman term or something like that. Feminism, I should say, more feminine. Yeah. Um, but then I didn't really thought about being as a straight man, how am I portraying fierce in my dance? And so it was a really good question because I really had to think about it. I was like, okay, how, mm. how am I going to portray this dance that is based in, you know, LGBTQ culture, make sure I represent it well and not like I'm parodying or just making fun of it. Like, how am I really representing it, you know? And so it was fun to like really sit down and think about that aspect. And I would have never had that experience that wasn't open to having that conversation and understanding that. And so I think dance can help you have a lot of those interesting conversations and learn a lot that you just did. You might not have normally do in your open. normal work time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let me just read this comment. Sila Poe is, I also believe in trusting that people will eventually pick up the knowledge about culture too. Some people hop on and dance for trends and then they leave. But he does believe the ones who stick around will eventually uh, pick up the culture knowledge and spread. And yeah, spread. I mean, yeah, yeah. And, and people were, I mean, there'll always be culture vultures, just something that you have to, again, a lot of these issues that happen in dance, they're not going away, you know, like, mm -hmm. this is, you know, a lot of, a lot of issues that the that black culture has gets mirrored in dance and just in different the ways. Ooh, so, good point, yeah. So that's why it's kind of hard to, it, that's why I, I understand when people have first certain frustrations in dance, because like, that's something that's in black culture for a long time. So you have to understand that, like, some of those things are never going away. But now that you know about them, now what are you going to do about it? How are you going to combat it? You know, it's like, don't worry about culture vultures. They're always going to be here. They'll come in for the flash of the pan, make their money, do what they want to do, and then keep it moving. But they have no um, impact on how you learn dance and how you want to perceive dance. And I think that's something to, to really understand. Like, there's always going to be the, the whack-ass dude that makes hella money. It's just always going to happen. <laughs> but, you know, 
is if you're into dance and that if you're, you know, if this is going to be your livelihood and you want dance to be a main thing, then learn all aspects of it. Understand the business aspect, understand the cultural aspect, understand the history aspect. And then that way you can decide for yourself how best to uh, have a sustainable living within dance. Yeah, I hear so much resilience in your thoughts, right? Like how you think, um, forward thinking, what can I do? Think about what I can versus what I can't control. Yeah, is that exactly. is that a learned experience or did someone teach you that? Um, it's it's mixed. It's mixed. I think you know as I started to, especially as a creative, like you know my my day to job is I'm a designer, um, I'm an art director now at an agency, but I've always been like more into the creative aspects of it. The the biggest things I've learned over the last five years is to understand the business aspect of being a creative. And it's like, it's awesome to be creative, but if that is going to be your main source of income and this is going to be sustainability, there's other aspects of it that you got to learn to balance everything out. So it's like, it's not enough anymore just to be like, oh, I like drawing. Yay. But how are you going to draw and feed your fam and, feed, and get, get, put rent in there? And like, there's aspects of business, there's aspects of marketing, there's aspects of, you know, understanding these other aspects to inform you. And just like in dance, like if dance is really going to be what you want to do for the rest of your life, and this is your, you know, source of income, then you got to learn about all the other aspects of dance, you know, organization, mm -hmm. marketing, mm -hmm. branding, you know, social media, all these things. And if you're not good at it, find a homie that is so they can plug those holes that you don't have, you know. Um, that's the really important part of just not trying to, not staying and reveling in our, in our creativeness. We're just like, we want, I just want to be creative and that's all I want to do. That's cool, but understand that people that are, less creative but better at those other things will probably be more successful <laughs> so you know you have to kind of find that balance for yourself not everyone is a business person not everyone is an entrepreneur that's completely fine but still understand that and then have a plan to kind of balance that that out balance okay nice and so we have a few minutes left cam again thank you for doing this and just catching up with me and doing a boba talk you know just out of yeah, these yeah. crazy times <laughs> uh last yeah, thing it's that fun, you dude. Yeah, last thing you want to leave the people watching. Any anything you want to say? Last thoughts. Mm, I think the biggest thing I want to say is just uh, be very mindful on um, just each each one, teach one. That's like the best thing I could say because I think as as you get older, especially when it comes to dance, like I said, we, I was making fun that we're OGs now, but um, understanding that to like you know other dancers are coming into dance for completely different reasons that you did. And so it's not a bad thing that they're not as hardcore about your specific style, but understand that they're coming in from a different way, but you can teach them and help them grow as well. And so like, you know, someone taught you, so take the time to teach, teach them. Like for when I was learning house in the Bay, I was pretty bad. This kind of just did it just because I, I liked it. And then when I went into um, New York, you know, I went to shelter and I was super excited and I was like dancing and hopping in the circle. Dude, older uh, black dude came over to me, put his hand on my, my shoulder, and was like, "Nope, <laughs> <laughs> nope." And then he took me to the side, and I basically relearned all my basic house steps in that night. Wow. And shelter goes until seven, eight in the morning. But like, I don't even know what that dude's name is. I forgot what he looks like. But he took the time to teach me, who was super excited about something, and taught mm -hmm. me the basics to like helped me on my dance journey. And I never forgot that because someone is always going to be in that realm where like, they're just not going to know. And so how would they know if someone didn't take the time to teach them? So, you know, it, it's, it's something to be said for a lot of the teachers that are out there, even if you're not a teacher and you're just helping others in, in dance that like, just teach, you know, like each one, teach one. It doesn't mean that you have to have a Zoom call with 100 students. It could just be you showing your friend how to do the Dougie and do it the right way. <laughs> So just basically keep, keep, if you keep that in mind when you're doing dancing, it's a, it's a lot less frustrating. It's a, it's a lot more fun. Yes. Good message. So you heard it here. Cam is saying each one, <laughs> teach one. And that <laughs> goes for everything, everything basically, across basically. the board. All right, homie, stay safe out there. Yep. Thank you Thanks for joining for, me. Yeah. Thanks for yes. having me. I mean, if people want to follow me, hey, DJ Cam, Instagram, my podcast is the table of truth. Um, and yeah, man, have fun. Yes. And I hope, hopefully I'll not see you on one of these again. Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm all, all right. It'll be fun. I think one, there'll be a good one with like me and Richter and, and you and Matthew. And we can yeah. Dan yeah. Dance nerded out. <laughs> yes. Sounds good. All right. All right. Peace out, Pam. Bye. See you later.